Hi guys, welcome back to the Carla Garrick Show. Today is episode 24 of the Carla Garrick Show. And today we will be doing part two of the series From the Apartheid State to the Free State, a podcast I recorded last fall with The Honest Offense. In today's episode, uh, you'll recall that we left it in a cliffhanger with my coming to America story. So we'll be covering a bit about that this week. Uh, you'll learn a little bit about the green card lottery and how I moved to America with two suitcases, $7,000, one brand new husband, and ended up in the Tenderloin, which is a inner city slum in San Francisco. So you'll learn a little bit about my immigrant story and, uh, and genuinely like how and why I learned about the Free State Project and why I choose to call New Hampshire home. So I hope you enjoy this episode 24 of the Carl the Garrick Show, kicking off with part two of the series From the Apartheid State to the Free State. Thanks for joining me. And remember, together, we can live free and thrive. So when you came to America, what was your plan? How old were you? And then what was your plan career wise? Um, so I was probably, I think I was 24. So I was still fairly young. And, you know, I'm unusual in the sense that I actually finished high school when I was 16. And I finished law school before I was 21. And in fact, in South Africa, you had to be 21 to be licensed as an attorney. And there was this TikTok time thing happening, because when they activate your green card, you have like a year to move, you have to come once to America to activate it, and then go back, plan your move, and then you have a year to come back. And so all these things were sort of happening in that same window of time. And, um, and so I finished high school early and, and law school early. And we knew that we needed to come someplace where, uh, you know, so first of all, you look at the map of America, and you're like, where do we go? You know, so I mean, initially, we literally put it on a wall and threw darts, and <laughs> the dart landed on Eureka, California. And okay. then I was like, where is this? You know, and this pre internet. So now you got to go to the library, yeah. you know, the whole thing. So we're like, okay, the Eureka's not for us, but let's look at the rest of California. And when we had taken that initial trip, we came out and we kind of went to New York. We went to Silicon Valley. We looked at uh, the Baltimore area, I think maybe DC, you know, so we, we looked around and California just made the best sense for us. I wouldn't have to retake the bar, uh, a, I wouldn't have to go back to law school. I could just take the bar exam. And my husband's a techie and, you know, Silicon Valley was the oyster. So we ended up in, 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 uh, in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco. Of course, everyone has a good immigrant story. So, so mine is, you know, two suitcases, no money. You don't, literally, you don't know anyone, right? Like I knew right. my sister and she was in Jersey. And other than that, it was like, so we had $7,000, I think, and like two suitcases. So we're staying in a motel in Chinatown, San Francisco, and we're trying to find a place to stay. But, you know, if you've got $7,000 and no jobs, you don't want to pay $1,000 or $2,000 a month in rent, right? right? So we find this apartment, and I'm like, well, it's in this neighborhood called the Tenderloin. And we're like, oh, it's just next to the Hyatt, you know. So the Tenderloin, for your viewers who are familiar, it's literally just maybe six blocks by six blocks, but it's the ghetto in the middle of San Francisco. It's actually, it has gentrified because Twitter actually opened an office there. But at this time, we are talking, there was a crack house in our basement. Oh, the day after we moved in, I was like, is that a bullet hole? <laughs> And then we were like, after two weeks, I was like, God, what is that smell? It was disgusting. And I'd gone to the library to use the internet and I came back and there were like police officers all in the alley and I was dressed quite nice. And they said, oh, are you the caretaker? And I was like, no, I just live in this dump. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, the and I was like, but why? And the police officer goes, oh, cause we got a dead guy and like 27 or whatever. And I was like, okay, first of all, at least now I know what the smell <laughs> is. <laughs> but say, you know, and I'm a 
very curious person. <laughs> so I can't lie. I was like, hmm. What happened? What is a dead? Yeah, well, no, I didn't even. Oh, okay. I was like, what does a dead person look like? And I was like, oh, do I want to? I and, and I actually said to the officer, I said, well, how dead is he? <laughs> and he goes, maggot dead and i was like no i'm out i'm out right uh so it was pretty gnarly those first yeah. three months you know our bathroom our bathtub was in the kitchen i mean it was like the real immigrant experience right. so we used those three months um i got a job initially i think it was uh, my first job was working for wilson sonsini which is a big law firm and uh and i was just doing discovery like i was in a big warehouse with boxes and my job was to look for this one name i don't remember what the name was but i remember i was like oh my god i'm getting 25 dollars an hour to just sit here and like read like that was a fortune for me <laughs> and and louis got a great job and then we you know incrementally moved from the tenderloin to like a very vanilla literally beige everything was beige townhouse and you know uh down in, in san, uh, san jose and then los gatos and then back to the city for the dot-com boom and bust so you know that's sort of the the, the story i guess in a nutshell <laughs> i have to say you are the literal opposite of a pessimist. If you can make discovery seem like an exciting job, because I, I did, I had to do some discovery work kind of when I was in between jobs. I basically did what you did, except it was e discoveries on the computer. And you're just going through email after email after email looking for a specific term or phrase, or you yep. just have to categorize the emails one thing or the other. And yeah, it was basically that, a machine, right? <laughs> all day long. And, and you're, yeah, like you're on an hourly wage, you're, you're not getting benefits. And so you, you kind of just brush right past that. It made it seem great. I just had to bring that point up because it was the worst job I've ever had. So <laughs> it's, just, it's incredible you were able to, to look at it that way. Yeah. And honestly, you know, I knew that there were steps that had to be taken. Actually, I finished that job and then very fortunately got a job at Apple Computer. And, you know, that was while I was taking the bar exam. Uh, I had to do bar review classes, obviously coming from an entirely different or similar, but not the same legal system, because I did petition the court and make a very compelling argument that it was the same enough that they should just let me in. Um, and, you you know, so at Apple, I actually worked on, on the acquisition of Next when Steve Jobs oh, yeah. came back to Apple. So I was lucky because I got the job there during the time that no one wanted to work there. Apple was kind of unpopular and it was like, oh, it, it was a has-been company. But then Steve came back and I just happened to, you know, get caught up in that thing. So I ended up, you know, working for really big Fortune 500 law firm, uh, not law firms, companies, Logitech kind of regret leaving Logitech to go to the tech startup that was going to make me a millionaire that did <laughs> not pan out. But, you know, live and learn. <laughs> That's really the Silicon Valley story. You know, yeah. everyone thinks the story is becoming a billionaire. This For 99% mm -hmm. of people, it's I'm going to this company that's going to make me a billionaire. And, oh, it's and not it doesn't work. pan and out. Yeah. With Logitech or Apple. Right. Well, I, I want to rewind a little bit because you mentioned, you know, the green card lottery. And that's it's a phrase I've heard. Everyone's heard. I don't really understand exactly how it works. Was it basically like you said, your family put your name in to live in America and they ended up giving you a call saying, hey, you won and now you can come to America. Is that really as straightforward as it as it went? I mean, that's kind of it. So the way it works is uh, the program itself is called the Diversity Lottery, Visa Lottery, and they give out 25,000 per year. And I think the program may have stopped. I haven't checked in a while. But the thinking was that for any country that had a historically low immigration rate to America, so specifically, don't hold this against me. They were excluding the Irish. <laughs> they were like, no more Irish. America's closed to the Irish. Um, but they would, you know, typically try and find countries. And, and they called it a diversity lottery, which in some ways seems like nonsense, because I was like, really? Does America need one more white lawyer? Right. Do we? But whatever, I was super grateful, right? Um, so you fill out, it's you type up one page and it has your name, you declare that you've finished high school, and then it has your address, I think, because it was literally, I got a thing in the mail. And if I recall correctly, I think in the year I applied, it was like they got 30 million applicants and they, they pull 
what they said is they just pull out like 25,000. Wow. Now, I do think there were designations like South Africa got 2,000 out of the 25,000 or whatever that is, like whatever magic sauce, the sausage making they're doing there at the INS, right? But be that as it may, I know someone somewhere is super regretting letting me in. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we haven't gotten to why yet. So I do, I want to bridge that gap between, uh, so I know, you know, you worked at, at Apple, you're working for these big companies, working at Wilson Sonsini, a big Silicon Valley tech firm. So you're kind of on that route. I know eventually you became an activist and you're running the Free State Project in New Hampshire. Bridge that gap for me. How did you, how'd you get from point A to point B? That is an excellent question. So in 2000, right, was more or less when the dot-com bubble exploded. So our experience was very much like, oh, we came with two suitcases and, you know, or $7,000 in, in the Tenderloin and then worked our way up. But part of that working up thing was a very maladjusted economy. The Silicon Valley was getting all this sort of Every, every 10 years, I guess, they create a bubble and it goes somewhere. So that time, it was the Silicon Valley bubble. So it was the tech bubble. It was the internet bubble. And to give you a sense of how, how big it was, right, Louis started a startup, my husband, and they closed like $7 million in first round funding, just like that. You know, they were on the front of the business, business week, you know, uh, tech magazines, like the whole thing, right? So all this money was just pouring in. And then, you know, and we were like, we're getting massages at our desks. We're like making money hand over fist. I mean, the parties, the excesses, we'll just leave it sure. at that. You know, um, you know, it was a good time. I, I can't lie. Um, but then the dot-com bubble burst and the company I had jumped to from Logitech was called Silent Corporation. And they uh, they were a, a, a e-commerce consulting firm. And so I left this fairly uh, affluent, really good company, Logitech, you know, they, they're, they're still around, they still make good products, all of that, uh, because I thought, oh, I'm gonna, you know, make these millions. And so I actually ended up going in and I had to lay off like 1,200 people, including myself, right? So you're just sort of in this situation where you're like, whoa, what just happened? Right. And so I started researching stuff and, and that sort of led me to Austrian economics and oh, where, where do these bubbles come from? What is monetary policy? I know it's not like sexy, but it's interesting to me. And I was like, oh, that's what happened, right? So we were in this bubble and then the bubble burst. And in that process, I found the Free State Project. And one of the things we decided when you know, so Louis' company folded. I had to lay myself off. Uh, we took our savings. We put our stuff in storage. And we actually went backpacking for like three years. We just went to Southeast Asia. We went back to Africa. We were in India. You know, we were just like, hey, can we live on 15 bucks a day? Yes, we can. Let's do it, right? Yeah. And so... Um, in that process, we were sort of looking, where would we land when we come back? And I knew for myself, I was like, I don't want to be a lawyer. I like the skills I've developed through it. I didn't like the hours I was working. And honestly, I felt a little bit like I was just a... Uh, like a Ottoman for the state. Like people would ask me, what do you do? And I was like, I kind of feel like I just moved piles of paper around for the government, like, you know. And and so I had this epiphany at, at uh, Annapurna's base camp. Now, some people say you were oxygen deprived and I'm like, <laughs> It's possible, it's but, you know, yeah. yeah, and I was just like, okay, I want to do something else. And I was like, you know how they ask you when you're little, people are like, what do you want to be when you grow up? We should do a better job of listening actively to that answer because people ask me that and I was like, I want to be a writer and a fashionista. Those were my two yeah. criteria. And I'm like, I'm almost 50. And I'm like, I still want to be a writer <laughs> and a fashionista, right? I, I can't tell you how much that speaks to me because I, you know, when I was a kid, I loved, I loved talking. I got in trouble for talking all the time. And, and so they kind of like, they, all the adults always thought, well, being a lawyer makes sense because lawyers have to talk a lot. And, and I, I was like, all right, I kind of went with that because I didn't know what else to do. And 
And I, I've kind of just in the last couple of years when I after I turned 30, I was like, I don't like being a lawyer. Like, what is it that I actually like doing? And, and it's this sort of thing is what I love. And I'm like, I wish I'd done this 10 years ago. But but you're right. right. It's like it, it takes you have to kind of get back in touch with who you were as a kid to find where you belong. Right. And I think we we do a disservice to society where we create this notion that we should, you know, this professionalism. It's actually a, a little bit of a form of statism, I think, right? It's like how you get people caught up in this system, right? Instead of saying, oh, we're unique and we're interesting and everyone should do what, you know, yeah. what they love. Why shouldn't at least aspirationally, why wouldn't we try and create a society where it's like, oh, what, maybe you can, maybe you can do what you love. Right. And the fortunate thing is technology is changing so fast. Now, it's probably going to enslave us too. The AI yeah, is right. like, I'm like, Duh. but anyway, um, but you know, the technology exists now. And I think what we're seeing is the decentralization of messaging so that someone like you can have your podcast or I can have mine, right? And maybe you don't have, you know, 40 million followers, but you have followers and people are like, I like you, I like your style, you know, and that is dangerous to the establishment because they want to be able to say, here are the four people you're allowed to listen to and hear the right. four people whose opinions, you know, you should do. And so this decentralization is actually, I mean, it's, it's huge and it's great for people who are pro Liberty. So we, we learned about the free state project. We went back to New York. I actually went back to school. Uh, so I went to city college where I met Lou. I did my MFA, got all the uh, short stories to put in this. And then we started coming to New Hampshire during that time to just kind of check it out. You know, it's more rural. I was kind of like right. a city it's girl. What's yeah. it going to be like, you know? Um, and it was an adjustment. I can't lie. I mean, I make fantastic Thai food now because <laughs> I had to learn, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, we knew we wanted to come. And so we came, we started to meet the community and I'm very solution driven. Like, I don't want to, it's not even that I'm solution driven. My time is very precious to me. I think the most important thing people can realize is your time is your life. So when you're looking at your calendar, it's like, how are you spending your time? Because that's literally your life. That's right. your living, right? And so I wanted to make sure that my time really mattered. And when we came to New Hampshire, it was just, it was a really good fit. They asked me to uh, to to do Pork Fest one year as a volunteer. I did that. It was very successful. They were like, oh, this girl's got some skills. Let's, uh, let's rope her in. And then, you know, you know, kind of went from there. So let's let's define what we're throwing out a lot of terms. Free State Project Pork Fest. Most yeah. of my audience is non-libertarian, so okay. all the libertarians listening probably know exactly what we're talking about. But no, most, not even all of them yeah. do. So yeah. So so yeah. So let's let's. Can you explain what the Free State Project sure. is? So the Free State Project is a movement of libertarians and liberty lovers. So people who really like value liberty and individualism and property rights and that kind of stuff. And so about 20 years ago, this guy called Jason Sorens, he was a Yale student at the time, and he wrote this paper uh, saying, you know, Libertarians are never going to win anywhere because we're too dispersed. Uh, it's not, you know, everyone's flavor of life. Uh, what would happen if we all concentrated in one place? And so, you know, in 2003, they took a vote. There were 10 different states you could pick from, and New Hampshire won. And so people said, okay, we're kind of creating this libertarian mecca or this one destination that people who are liberty forward, who really do care about this as a, as a a leading living principle, right? Um, we should all start to concentrate together so that we can, uh, you know, have a smaller, more limited government. We could have more economic prosperity, uh, dynamic sort of entrepreneurial environment. So the Free State Project was born. And so we've been around now, I think it's like 18 years, 19 years. And people have been moving for all of that time, we're seeing a massive growth now, of course, because, I mean, it's sad to say, but it's like totalitarianism is good for business, you know? <laughs> right. And um, 
and so it's it's uh, the Free State Project is a libertarian movement to attract people to the state of New Hampshire. Why New Hampshire? Low taxes, no personal income tax, really large legislative body. So the House is like 400 people. Oh, wow. And in a state where we only have about 1.2 million people, you like you represent 3,000 people. Like when I go out, I run into my reps. I was at a qualified immunity conference the other day and there were 50, 60 people. And I was like more, I think like 10 were not sitting legislators. So just the access of being like, there's the ACLU, there's this organization, here are all these reps, you know? So it's very accessible. And then the quality of living here is just phenomenal. And New Hampshire is incredibly beautiful and it has a little bit of everything. So it has cities, it has rural areas. We have a short coastline. We're gonna have to annex Maine one day, but shh, don't tell anyone <laughs> for a nice long coastline. Right. But, um, but it's just a great place. And it's honestly, it always wins either first or second place for the freest state in, uh, in America. And then also for the best quality of living. There's a huge homeschooling community. The schools are still pretty good here, although that seems to be going in a, in, in a not the best direction currently. But it's just, uh, it's, it, it feels like the Switzerland of America. And it's this like kind of best kept secret, which I'm constantly talking about like should we make more noise or should we just sneak under the radar <laughs> right well yeah, it's funny because you, you see people in in texas and florida that are getting all these people coming in from from california and other states and they're they're saying stay out we're, we're yeah. happy with what we have but yep. but yeah you're, you're there there's that that tension it's like well we want more people to be into what we're into so but it's it's hard to kind of figure out what that balance is. Yeah, I mean, we're laughing right now because there's actually a project that a bunch of free staters started that's, I think it's called the progressive state movement or something, where we're encouraging people who live in New Hampshire who kind of aren't pro-liberty, who are more interested in socialism. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with socialism except the economic basis right. of it. Like, we all like people. We all want no one to suffer. It's not like libertarians are monsters who are like, ah, ha, 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 all right? Like, you're you're like, no, I want, right? You're like, no, I want a great world. And based on my knowledge and based on a deep understanding of economics, which apparently no one has anymore, it's like, of all the ways to do it, this is the best way that will raise the most people out of poverty in the fastest way. And what people forget as well is that poverty is the natural state of being. Anyone who is not poor, for whatever reason, because your daddy was rich or because you thought of some great widget or whatever, the natural state of humanity is poverty. So the fact that we are rising out of poverty fast and, you know, everyone's doom and gloom and like everything's bad, but honestly, the world's the best it's ever been, you know, barring COVID, but... <laughs> You always have to throw that in. Yeah. Yeah. Was your husband, yeah, I was just talking to a friend of mine who I, I've known for a long time and, and he was kind of a, kind of a fuck up when, when I knew him, when he was younger, he's got married a couple of years ago and, and they're expecting their first kid now. And he's, we, we were having this kind of conversation about how, you know, he was telling me how when you're married and you have that person who you knows with you and you, you have your lives intertwined. He's like, you, he's like, I both feel this responsibility that I, I need to take myself and my life seriously for her. But I also feel this sense of comfort that I know she's here to back me up. And, and it kind of changed his perspective on, on how he views himself and his own confidence and what he wants out of life and what he thinks he can get out of life. And so it was, it was really interesting hearing him talk about how having that partner and, and what that strength has given him. And I think that's something that we, we really kind of underplay in, in mm. modern society is having that that person with you to go through life. Your husband seems like... He must have been. He must just be so game to go with you. I, you you met in, in South Africa, right? He's, yeah. And so to come with you to America, to Silicon Valley, and then to go backpacking with you for three years, and then to say, hey, yeah, let's go to New Hampshire. I, what kind of person and personality is he? And 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 did you have to do any convincing of him to to make any of these steps? 